joining the elections committee is definitely the most um, uh, pertinent need that we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I'll say from experience that working on these committees has been a powerful way to make connections, you know, and to really, really sink your teeth into the work of the field and to, to meet people and to get to work with them. So, you know, though it all is volunteerism, it really is volunteerism that um, is win-win in my experience. Agreed. Um, and it looks super awesome on your CV to say that you are on a leadership True. team for the <laughs> international network. So um, it looks like Michelle has her hand up. Michelle, you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, uh, didn't you? I just had a quick question about the the reasoning behind someone being able to be on the committee as well as a candidate. Um, in most organizations I've seen, those are usually separated out rather than having somebody on the elections committee also be a candidate. Yeah, so we have the officer following that, that model. So the officer will not be able to also be a candidate for another position. We wanted to, you know, it is still a relatively small network. Um, and just, just speaking free, frankly, we don't necessarily always get a lot of people stepping up to, <laughs> to volunteer for things. So we, we didn't want to cut off the people who, who would volunteer to be on the committee, but also would like to be candidates from doing so. As the committee, as the network continues to mature, it'd be great to get to a point where the entire election committee is fully separate. We just feel that um, for right now, because this initial work is so, um, so developmental that we want to allow those people to to wear both hats if they so choose. Um, and this is just for the secretary, treasurer, and the communications officer. So, um, you know, the, the Digicon chair and the co-chair for the network, that will be further along, um, you know, towards the spring and summer. And certainly we could have a conversation about maybe separating the elections committee from the um, people who are looking for those positions at that time. And because we'll have some of the groundwork laid. People are asking in the chat, like Mike is asking, when are elections? So we have an immediate need for two of the positions, the secretary treasurer and the communications officer. And we don't have an immediate need for the Digicon chair and the co-chair of the network, because that's me in both cases right now. And, but, and I'm gonna wrap up sort of this season, but those will be um, in May or June. So we're looking at December, January for the, for the two, and then May, June for the other two. Good question, Michelle. It's good to know, Mike. We could let's make note of that in the, um, if you don't mind, Jen, in the notes that Mike would like to be participant in the spring elections. Okay. All right. Okay, we have several initiatives um, that we introduced back in August and I wanna reiterate because I know all of us have been kind of going through a lot um, this fall. So first of all, we have a new structure for our quarterly meetings. Historically, our quarterly meetings have all been sort of impromptu. We come up with a theme and talk about that and we really enjoy that. Um, but we're, we're keeping that structure. We're just moving it into a new format, the pop-up meeting structure, which I'll speak about in a moment. So our quarterly meetings like this are going to be a little bit more structured going forward. We were going to start this new progression now, <laughs> um, but we pushed it forward again because of everything that's happening. So basically every year, three of the four will be in a sequence where we'll have a theme for the year. Um, and it'll begin with the member spotlight. So for example, this year or next year, I should say, calendar year, it's going to be UD on the digital environment. It's sort of our theme for 2021. And so in February, we're gonna have people from our network who feel like we're doing something really great with UD on the digital environment that we wanna share. And so that might be one or two or three universities or colleges. Um, who representatives from that will come and share. What are they doing? Kind of as a showcase and allow for question and answer and dialogue. 
And then in the following, this case in April, we'll then have a round table discussion. We'll break out into small groups and we'll kind of troubleshoot with each other what's going on at all of our different institutions. Where are we and how can we move forward? It'll be a facilitated round table type discussion like what we've always done. Um, and then in August, we're gonna introduce a digital design lab where based on the round table discussions, we're gonna isolate some big questions that we're still wrestling with as a community, bring those to the table and just work together with all the brilliant minds that we have to see what we can accomplish in an hour and a half or two hours to really move it forward. Because we don't always have access to so many brilliant minds at one time. Um, and that leaves the fourth quarterly meeting open for whatever, you know, probably some sort of a, a regroup elections, you know, organizational sort of thing, um, like what we're doing right now. So that's kind of what we're looking at moving forward. Quarterly meetings. Say too that we wanted to leave that one option open in case something like COVID shows up, which rocks all of our world collectively. Um, and so if that if that in fact happens that we would have that option um, already sort of in place that mm -hmm. we could do that. And we also do have some more options for pop up meetings as needed. So if if there's something that comes up that's that's going to pertain to a lot of people in our in our network, we could just have a quick pop up meeting about that one thing. Excellent. And so for upcoming in February, we're going to have um, Dara Ryder and Mark Glynn, um, who are both in Ireland. Um, Dara is the CEO of AHEAD Ireland and Mark Glynn, the head of teaching enhancement within uh, Dublin City University. And then also my colleague, Miriam Bender Larson. And so they're going to be talking about what's happening with AHEAD and with the larger network that um, AHEAD is leading for UD on higher education in Europe. And then Miriam's going to be talking about our initiatives to, to implement UDL in a high flex model and an online um, jumpstart program for faculty, that sort of thing, and what, what's been going well with those types of programs. We do have a new listserv. I hope you got the email from me from the listserv. You can you should be able to tell us a listserv email because it's much flashier, <laughs> you know, with with um it, it just looks nicer if you didn't get that email i know i have a pretty stringent spam filter that anything that has the word unsubscribe in it automatically goes to my spam folder um, and that serves me very well but sometimes i miss out on newsletters so um, if you did not get that it went out on october 29th please check your spam folder for that um, and and just use rules or whatever to make sure those don't go to spam and you can also let me know and i'll help you with that um, so the process for extending community messages, this is not yet what I hoped it would be, whereby let's say that Ruby has a question or, or research she's doing, she wants to reach out to the community, she can't just go blast an email through the listserv at this point. Unfortunately, it doesn't yet work that way. We are hoping to move into a learning design platform once we get our new leadership team in place, and that will facilitate that type of member to member member to community type communication. In the meantime, if you have something like that, just send it to me, send it to Jen. We're glad to blast it out through the listserv to the community um, and facilitate, you know, we'll say respond directly to Ruby at this email so that um, we can get out of the way, but that'll be how we can blast it out for now. Um, and as soon as we have a communications officer, our hope is to start a newsletter that will just kind of give updates from the community. You know, we'll solicit those from people what's going on that you want to share what is some new research you've discovered that type of thing and then what's happening with the network so we'll be excited to get that going as soon as we have a communications officer as well and then i'll be going through the list there the digicon is coming up um february 4th and 5th we got um plenty of, of cfps i was a little bit worried for a little bit but they came through um, so we had a goal of 40 and we we hit and surpassed it a little bit with 44. um so i'm working on getting a brainstorm session together with the committee for how we're going to structure our time. We have a really significant goal of wanting this to be um, a successful digital conference in a way that not all of them have been lately in my experience, where we really want to facilitate networking and interaction and collaboration with people, not just come and watch a Zoom session and then go back to your normal nine to five job, you know, you know type thing. So, we want to facilitate um, meaningful roundtables, design labs, coffee bars, you know, that sort of thing going on during the day. And so once we figure that out, um, I'm going to create the structure and, and include that with the ticket sale so people know what they're what they're purchasing. Um, tickets are not going to be very expensive. Last year they were $20, I think. This year they're going to come out at um, $50. So we're hoping that even if your university or institution can't 
send you somewhere that that's not cost prohibitive, but we are going to have structures in place for students or others who for one re for any reason at all, that is cost prohibitive, we want you there, we'll work with you, that's no problem. Um, so that will be in there. We also are introducing this year institutional discounts. So, you know, if an institution wants to say, I want to send all of our 30 education faculty to this conference, we'll offer bulk discounts in hopes of, of getting um, more people there to the table. Uh, we'll be encouraging people to take the days off. That's one of the things I've noticed with digital conferences lately is that people are not taking time off work while they're, so they're at work, but they're also attending a digital conference and it just isn't going well. So we're going to be encouraging people very strongly. Imagine you're going to a real conference, you know, like take the time off work so you can focus on this, so you can be really present. And we're hoping that makes a difference. I'm very excited to announce that our colleague Lillian Nave, um, who is the host of Think UDL podcast, will be our keynote speaker this year, and she's going to be fantastic. So I'm looking forward to that. All right, Jen. Yeah, so um, so the rest of our time today, we're really going to spend um, talking about <laughs> talking about uh, UDL in the time of COVID. And Eric, you're going to have to explain the reference on this one because I got nothing. Um, Ruby, just Ruby, did you get it? Somebody looks like they got it. Maybe. No, I it was just it was, it was a dad joke. Reference. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a former literature teacher slash dad joke. You know, he wrote Love in the Time of Cholera. So it's like UDL in the time of COVID. Never mind. <laughs> Never. No, it's not okay. Um, okay, so we're going to um, break into uh, breakout groups. Um, and uh, I'm assuming most of you have, are familiar with Zoom because you made it this far. But um, if not, we'll be sending out um, one of these breakout room invites. And you just click on that um, where it says join breakout room. And we're going to be using a Google slide deck. So let me go ahead and open that so you can see. So in this Google slide deck, you'll have the directions for what we're going to do. I'll also explain those in just one moment. And then each breakout room has its own slides. So breakout group one, breakout group two, et cetera. And I think I put like a bunch in here, which we will not need that many. Um, but there should be four or five-ish people in a room. And so um, once you get there, your, your group will work on your slide. And so you're going to just sort of process these questions and make some notes about your conversation. Let me move back to this. Um, ideally, when we come back together as a group, we'd like to hear what each group talked about. So if you could choose somebody to, um, to share when we come back, uh, that would be great. So the questions we're really wanting people to uh, kind of talk about today are, are what are some of the things that are working? I think a lot of us are pretty, pretty familiar with what's not going real well um, currently in, in, uh, in our universities and our, in our colleges, but what is going well? What are some of the things that are working? So we've got these questions to prompt you. Um, what positive outcomes has COVID had on the implementation of UDL at your institution? How have you been using COVID and other current events to help further the vision and implementation of UDL? And then what do you see as the, some next steps to maintain this moment? momentum when, um, when the crisis uh, has diminished. So those are the questions. Again, they're at the front of the slide deck. Oh, no, nope, not that one. Um, so let me close out of this here and stop sharing. I believe, Eric, you'll have to set up the um, breakout rooms. And we've got 36 people, so we could just do six groups. Um, if you get into a room where everybody's muted and their camera's turned off and no one's talking, you don't have to stay in there and just be awkward. Um, you can leave that breakout room, come back to the main room, and then we will put you into a different room. <laughs> I hate when that happens. So we'll split you up. Just when you get into the room, take a look and see what your breakout room number is. Go find that slide and um, have a good discussion. And we'll, we'll come back together in, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes or so. Yep. That sounds good. And so I've created um, six rooms. One of the rooms I deleted so that you will stay here. And that way I can intercept people when they're coming in, if people are coming in late. Um, but this Jennifer. is the breakout room for that last room. So we'll see you what all in about 20, 25 there. minutes. I'm so sorry. Who? who uh, oh, I was, oh I was, I'm so sorry. So we're talking, <laughs> um, slide deck link. Oh, sorry, Mike. I, I didn't realize you were speaking. I, was, I thought it was an echo. <laughs> um, what, what were you saying? I'm sorry. Um, slide deck link. It is in the notes. Do you have access to the Google Doc? And I will uh, send it. We can send it out. Actually, you can send it out, Eric. In the you can send a message out to all breakout rooms. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll do that. But it's also it's also in the Google Doc, which I can put in the chat box. 
Thank you. Maybe. Yes. Okay, so this is the Google Doc. It's at the top of the, the Google Doc. And I think it says something like, uh, what does it say? Google Slides for breakout room activity. Wendy, I'm going to send you the, the first one on the list. I'm going to send you to a breakout room that ended up with fewer people, if that's OK. OK, so we're a breakout. <laughs> well, hi, guys. Well, hello. <laughs> Jen, Jen, I think you're in, in room five. If it's not yes. showing, you can click on breakout room. No, I, I did it, but I came back to make sure I, we forgot to put the thing in the chat. So I will go. Oh, hey, guys. Bye. But hello, I um, have my granddaughter came early, so um, she's homesick. My apologies. No worries. No worries at all. So I got a little psyched out. I didn't get the go to your breakout room. Yeah, because, because this, this is your breakout room. So, so like, oh, well, here I am. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, that allows me to still be here if people come in late without having to like, like this. So I don't have to, <laughs> to leave leave the breakout room and come back and so forth. Hi, Mary. Ian Marie, is that a mural behind you? No, actually, one of my students designed that for her creative representation of diversity. That is beautiful. Yeah, and I said, can I use it forever? And she was just like so tickled pink. So yeah, thank you. Is it a green screen? Um, actually, it's just an image. I just took an image of it and, and used it as my backdrop. You can do that? Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Message me and I'll show you sometime. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure everybody knows everybody. So why don't we take a moment just to introduce ourselves? Dixie, do you want to do you want to start? Okay. Can you guys, you, you guys can hear me? Um, from England, but work in Norway at um, the Norwegian Univers uh, University of Science and Technology um, with Katja, who's like also involved. Um, yeah, and I work with, um, yeah, implementing a lot of <laughs> UDL and um, at, yeah, doing faculty support and training and stuff for use of digital technology. Wonderful. Good to have you here. Ruby? Hi, I am Ruby Owen. And I am at Trinity International University, uh, about an hour from downtown Chicago, north, oh, awesome. almost to Wisconsin. Um, our house is like six miles from the Wisconsin line. And wow. um, I am the director of the Division of Education. I'm here at Trinity and I'm, um, but my background is special education. So that was the route that I came to UDL through is yeah. um, special education and my intense desire to see more inclusive settings in K-12 and also higher ed. Awesome. Who else? Mary? Is that, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, sure. hi. Um, I was in another breakout room, but I was having a problem with my browser. You know how it is when you borrow a laptop from the university? So hi, I'm Mary Bethelowitz, and I am right outside the Philadelphia area in a little town called Collegeville, Pennsylvania, and I'm at Cabrini University. And currently I'm the director of Universal Design for Learning, although in the age of COVID, I'm not really sure what that means right now because we're so, um, you know, we're not really working on campus, so it's been very difficult. And I came to UDL through my own daughter with disabilities, although I have a background in special education, it was through um, giving birth to a child with disabilities that um, I really did. She was the first preschooler fully included at age three in our state of Pennsylvania. And um, uh, I just, you know, we just really wanted an inclusive journey for her. She was having that experience within her own family and we were very determined that that was going to follow her through. Um, and she did go to college, which is, uh, you know, we. Uh, she's just this wonderful, spunky, resilient kid. And, um, and to me, it just shows you what inclusion is all about. Because mm -hmm. when she was first born, you know, neurologist at CHOP basically said, ah, we'll just sort of let C 
see what every day unfolds for her. And the way I found myself to UDL was through an orig a product that they had developed called the Thinking Reader, that I was just looking for computer assisted instruction that I felt could really help to facilitate comprehension for her. And um, through doing the research as you know, good parents, sometimes we just sort of hunker down and do that kind of stuff. I found this product and, and I reached out to the folks at CAST and from that, that very first day of reaching out to them, I was amazed at how wonderful they were at, at sharing their knowledge and sharing their information and it really did make a difference because when I, the more I read about the framework, the more I thought, well, wait a minute, I, she would so benefit from this, but so would every child in the class benefit from this. So that was my journey. And I am a special education teacher, but I'll tell you what, it's a different hat to be a parent. There's no doubt about it. That's good. And so I am doubling today as grandma at home. So I there apologize, guys. <laughs> she I just jumped it. up on my lap. If you can see her. Oh, <laughs> so, um, hi everybody. I'm <laughs> yeah, this is our future here. Um, I'm Ann Risto, and I work for the University of South Florida for this um, Institute of School Reform, which um, my day job is for the Problem Solving Response to Intervention Project, where I am the Student Support and Academic Achievement Coordinator. So all of that consists of acronyms, so I just set it up, <laughs> set the strands out for you, but um, I've been advocating for special education since I was in um, primary school myself because my best friend had um, dyslexia and we spent our time at playground under the slide memorizing reading and trying to work the system so that she didn't get into trouble in school and um, that led me to years of support for inclusion work and inclusion um, worked in my district with inclusion as well as the um, MTSS coordinator mm -hmm. and then worked in school improvement for the state for years as well. So I'm kind of a jack of all trades and yeah. um, still love teaching as well. So I do some adjunct work or pick up a class for the university um, once or twice a year because of everything else that I'm required to do, but um, love the work love advocating and am very excited about where we're going um, with you. Yeah, me Wonderful. too. Good to have Ann. Mm -hmm. Mike? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Mattis. I am a learning designer at the University of Southern Maine in Portland, Maine. Um, I work with uh, instructors, or with uh, uh, professors on designing courses, um, usually uh, online related stuff. Um, I, I don't even remember when I came to UDL um, or found UDL. It's been kind of a part of my practice for a long time. Uh, I'm currently <clears throat> working on my dissertation, which involves um, testing, um, basically working with an instructor and kind of gathering, you know, through a qualitative interview, like gathering their experience, like learning UDL, um, and then also measuring the effects of what we do to their course, um, measuring the effects of what happens, you know, from to the students' experience based on our UDL inspired, you know, changes to their course. Um, so I'm, I've got a really big uh, research interest in uh, in UDL as well. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's where I'm at these days. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and hi, welcome, Lily. I'm glad to have you here. I announced your uh, your being our keynote speaker for the Digicon. We're all excited. Um, I'm actually going to kick you over to breakout room five because they're a little bit short on people. Right. That's when I got bumped out of grief. That's okay. my fault, Eric. I got bumped okay. out of five. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we know. <laughs> that's how they're short. <laughs> hey Lillian, did you get the, the invite to breakout room five? Okay, we'll see you soon. We're gonna come back after the discussion. I think she's gone. Um, and I'm Eric Moore. Um, I'm the Universal Design for Learning and Accessibility Specialist at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, where I've been since 2014. I earned my PhD here and then they retained me to 
um, to try to push UD on accessibility on campus. Um, and it's been a wonderful challenge, you know, being in an R1 institution that uh, is very set in its ways, <laughs> um, finding ways to, to make inroads, you know, and to develop, develop capacity. Um, it's been, been a challenge, but, you know, I've found I've, I've had to do a lot of work to expand beyond just focusing on UDL and to instructional design and to technology enhancement and then attaching UDL to those things. And that's been effective for me. Um, I got into UDL when I was teaching overseas in Indonesia and South Korea, um, working with incredibly diverse students in, in many very obvious ways um, and, and feeling very insufficient with the way that I was teaching without UDL, <laughs> um, you know, and, and actively looking for ways to expand my approach to teaching and learning, you know, came across UDL um, and was immediately it resonated, you know, I put it into practice and it, it was making a difference, you know, I just yeah. committed to it. So my master's, my PhD made it a focal point. Um, and I'm very, feel very fortunate to be where I am today as a UDL um, practitioner, researcher, facilitator. So, um, so we're all in various, various places, um, you know, but kind of all experiencing COVID. So, so the question that we have today is, is what are some of the positive outcomes that COVID has had on the implementation of UDL in your institution? And we're on slide seven is our sort of space for notes. If anybody's wanting to, to kind of record some of the ideas that we're sharing here. Anybody want to start with that one? I'll go ahead and start, Eric. Uh, I, I'm hoping and Granted, right now, all of our faculty are, are teaching from home. So it's not like we have the opportunity to have face-to-face -face a lot of interactions. However, it does seem as though increasingly I'm getting more comments, emails, even text messages from faculty who are recognizing that there are issues that they're having difficulty addressing in the online environment. And so for me, the positive, as I even said to my dean yesterday, is whereas before I felt like I was, you know, giving these workshops or creating these videos, and I didn't really know if they were resonating, I'm thinking that perhaps the idea is beginning to resonate. Like, oh yes, well maybe remember when that group was talking about the fact that let's make sure that you represent that, that, that content, that text in multiple ways to reach those diverse learners online. Or, or let's you know, use this checkpoint to address executive functioning issues. I'm hoping, and I really am hopeful that I think they're going to be more um, uh, open to the idea of exploring this with maybe a bit more depth for next semester. And as a matter of fact, we, we just finished uh, with our instructional designer, we created sort of, we're calling them three stackable credentials. And I'm hoping that they take advantage of them over break, but we'll see, we'll see. One of the things I've noticed that's been really helpful, and Eric, I was trying to get, my computer has just all of a sudden gotten really slow. So the slide deck is not wanting to load very quickly. I was starting to wanting to type notes and can't even and Anybody who wants, wants to contribute to that slide deck on, on slide seven and to capture notes would be, that'd be great. I'll happily do it when my computer decides <laughs> to load it. Uh, but um, one of the things that I've been pleased with um, at my university is I'm seeing a greater ability to be flexible and to really think about how to break down barriers and to reduce the stress on our students. Yeah. And um, our dean um, has tended in the past to be very much stay in the box, stay within the rules, stay within the parameters. And she's been much more willing to, to allow us to feel like we have the room to be flexible. Okay. So we're kind of doing a high flex model where mm -hmm. we're in class face to face with masks and socially distanced. But then we also have, um, we had a donor graciously donate enough funds to provide us with big screen monitors and computers for the back of the room. So we can have people on Zoom calls while we're teaching live. And what that has allowed us to do is be more flexible in who joins the call on Zoom. It's okay. not just 
the person who's quarantined or the person who didn't feel safe coming to campus and is doing all classes remote, but it's someone who um, is sitting in a waiting room waiting for a loved one to have surgery. It's, um, I had a student who needed to travel home and she lives in rural Wisconsin. And if she would have traveled home after my class, she would have been on back country roads after dark and she didn't feel safe doing that. So her roommate went with her, her roommate drove, they left before my class. She accessed my class on her phone via Zoom. So it's allowed us greater flexibility with how students access our content. Right. Uh, and then my, my, you know, they automatically record. So then I just post them. Mm -hmm. And then anyone who wants to go back and review, or if you had to miss class for some reason, you can at least go back and hear the recording. So what I'm seeing is a greater ability to be flexible because we have the technology now to do so um, from a, from a class accessibility standpoint, but also more of a willingness to accept students reasons for needing extra time without questioning it. <laughs> so, you know, in the past, I think we've all experienced the, oh, Mr. So-and-so asked me for an extension because he says he's been sick, but I don't really think he's been sick kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. now people are just like, you need an extension? Sure, take an extension. <laughs> and um, and, and, and st I haven't seen students abusing that. I haven't um, either. I've been very flexible with like, hey, if you need some yeah, grace, yeah. I'll happily give it to you because there's time Absolutely. I need grace. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm seeing people being more willing to do that and yeah. and um, mm -hmm. reducing those barriers for students too. It's about your learning. I don't care when you yeah. turn it in, just yeah. get it done kind of thing. So. And Ruby, I, I agree with you. I have not seen students take advantage of that at all. And I have also seen increasing numbers of faculty be more willing to consider the mental health and the anxiety of our student mm -hmm. when they're mm -hmm. planning their instruction. I, I so agree with you about that. Thank you mm -hmm. for using that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You begin a good point about the mental health. I think that we're, we're talking more openly about that. And that yes, we are. Of trauma and yep. we need to take care of our mental health and people are openly talking about it where before it was a taboo subject almost. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's a good thing mm -hmm. for sure. Girl, I don't know if you saw the chat, welcome. Um, we're, we're discussing some questions that are in a, a Google slide that I linked in the chat there. Thank you, Eric. Sorry, I was late. I was in a meeting and just ended with a course design meeting there. No worries, glad to have you here. Yeah, so we're just talking about what, what's going well. You know, what has COVID pushed us in the right direction um, for in these past few months? Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of people people realizing things are not as impossible as they thought they were, you know, <laughs> like like allowing allowing students, kind of like what you're saying, Ruby, allowing students to attend class in a, in a more of a high flex model, you know, historically there was just, no, that's, it won't work, it's not possible. You can't teach this class not in a brick and mortar setting, you know, and they're, they're learning that you can, and, and it's not just students, it's faculty and staff, like, you know, this this thought that, that for so long, people, you know, uh, our faculty and staff who have disabilities have asked to be able to work remotely. And I've been told, you know, that's just not, we, we, we can't, we need, we need accountability. We need, and they're now seeing a lot of these folks are working much more efficiently from home than they ever did in the office, you know? And so I'm hoping that some of these things don't change, you know, <laughs> that, that mm -hmm. they, they stay changed rather. Um, but I think it's just been a lot of perceptional uh, perspective changes that have occurred but what's possible, what's good, um, what's allowable. Yeah, that's a good point. And I've noticed in both staff and among students with the option to work remotely, I'm seeing increased attendance and fewer need for, or le less need for PTO. Because if I'm allowed to work from home and I'm feeling just kind of crummy, mm -hmm. you know, crummy enough that I don't wanna go to work and crummy enough that I have symptoms I'm worried about spreading, but I don't feel so sick that I have to be in bed all day, then they're working from home and we're getting increased productivity that way as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I um, find that some of the students in my class and they're taking five online classes this semester, they are struggling or they're sharing with me that they are struggling. 
part of that, when I probe a little bit deeper and try to figure out what's really going on here, I do think it does come back to how the design of the class, how much engagement there's been between the instructor and the student. And from my end, I'm just trying to take lots of notes for my dean and for the dean to share them with the provost to get this kind of feedback. Because in case, for instance, we're a small university, we need these students to return back in the spring. And for some of them, I worry that if they are not satisfied with the level of instruction that they're receiving online, that some of them will choose to sit out a semester, you know, and we can't really afford to have that happen. We are definitely a tuition driven institution. So it's really important that we document this so that we can make those changes to give them a better, stronger learning experience. And I'm convinced that UDL is the way to provide that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I think it's a good point. Uh, uh, my uh, reflection about uh, supporting. Uh, so first, do you have Eric? Do you mind? I kind of. Oh, go, go ahead. Sure, sure. Yeah. All right. So, I'm an instructional designer from U University of Missouri System. So I got my PhD from University of Kansas, um, background universal design and mobile oh, okay. learning. Uh, so I think when I was supporting the COVID, uh, the task force, uh, we. Uh, as a central uh, office e-learning, we support the four campuses over uh, something around 60,000 to 70,000 students. We see a lot of struggles. And I uh, I think the most recent following up report uh, based um, about the report, but also the students and the faculty feedback, it's about the the interaction, the engagement in mm -hmm. online. So mm -hmm. that one seems uh, a really um, a challenge right now. Uh, students feel very demotivated. So uh, how we kind of built the interaction shaping the instructor's presence online and made a connection, uh, help yeah. the students, you know, uh, stay engaged. Uh, that is the current challenge I mm -hmm. see um, in my daily work. So, yeah. And uh, there's also some faculty, they talk about, they really dislike teaching online. Yeah, but I feel like people already starting to do it. They see the benefits and the flexibility. Uh, mm -hmm. There's still kind of like the buy-in for the people, uh, like the uh, resistance group, that part of the people's mindset is interesting to see how um, there's some change or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's them. Mike, do you want, do you want to um, just stick to the chat or do you want to share out verbally about what you're seeing there? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, my thing isn't directly UDL related, but, um, you know, when COVID hit, we were in the, also in the middle of a, uh, an LMS migration. Um, so we got to do those things simultaneously. Uh, and just over the last year, you know, those things have like greatly increased um, my department's like profile and credibil credibility within the institution. Um, I think there's a lot more, um, somewhat more mindfulness on the part of uh, faculty to, you know, uh, think about things from a student focused uh, point of view and UDL provides a, it's a great opportunity to, you know, rally around and, and promote UDL, um, which is what I've been, you know, trying to do, you know, within within my department. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, we've been seeing too, in terms of professional development, a shift, um, you know, so I, I'm a, a workshop coordinator for my team. Um, and we've seen our numbers increase dramatically, I think probably for a lot of reasons, but in part because we're not requiring people to physically come find parking you know, walk through the rain or the 95 degree weather or whatever to get somewhere. It's just come in your pajamas and learn how to use Adobe Suite, you know, or, or how to caption your videos or whatever. And so we were seeing so much of that. And, and also we've, it's pushed us to develop more asynchronous content, like more just in time learning. And I'm, I'm hoping that that too um, will, will persist long after COVID has faded. Dixie, I'm curious if you're seeing anything, if you're willing to share uh, yeah. what you're seeing in Norway. 
I think it's been really positive for us. Obviously, also bad, but um, in general, kind of a combination of what all you guys have been saying. Um, like Mike, our whole unit has had a massive publicity boost, <laughs> which has been really good because suddenly, because we also, we do universal design, but we also do like just how to use Zoom and stuff. And so we've been running an awful lot of courses. Suddenly people realize where our courses are and then they see they need the Zoom course, but maybe then they also take the course into how to make things more accessible. Um, and we only do universal design for like digital. Um, and it's we also are benefited because in January, the, uh, there's a new law, meaning that things have to be universally designed. Um, and so that's helping as well. There's like a lot of kind of movement people are learning about it um and then especially all the mental health stuff as well um we've been given funding to run courses um for the students mental health and like how to create good learning environments uh, online um whereas before there wouldn't be anything and before uh, we have loads of professors who would just be like <sighs> yeah you know yeah you have to teach in one way and especially with the exams you have to take an exam in one way they have to be at university they have to be four hour long exams and now suddenly they can't be four hour long exams because you can't come to you you know nobody's having there are no physical exams now um so they have to think completely new uh, and then we're kind of slipping in <laughs> universe design think how everyone can how everyone can um yeah how you can measure that everyone's learned kind of thing um so now in general, it's actually been really, really positive for us. <laughs> Unfortunately, like, yeah, horrible silver lining. Yeah, I've been thrilled that um, people are, have embraced alternative assessment type, alter alternative modes of assessment, I should say, um, because alternative assessment means something different in special ed. But um, we, they did a session, um, our equivalent of your department um, here on campus did a session on um, providing opportunities for expression um, in alternative formats than just a traditional exam. And it was very well attended. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how many people are actually putting into play what they learned, but at least people attended and got the seed planted mm -hmm. at least. So that's been exciting. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're seeing that too. You know, a lot of faculty are concerned with cheating um, with their traditional mm -hmm. as, you know, multiple choice type exams online. We're like, well, there's other types of assessment, out there, you know, <laughs> that, are, that are more more open-ended, you know, more more uh, whatever. And so we, we've actually been using that to sort of push a different agenda, like, and also trying to get them away from, like, even though we facilitate um, th those monitoring softwares, you know, we have it, and we're the ones that train people how to use it. We're like, you really have to understand how not effective this is. Even as we're teaching how to use it, you should not use it. <laughs> like here are the better things for you to be using you know and it, it is getting through to people i think um, we're seeing a lot more people try to do more, more um, open-ended qualitative type assessments and we're, we're showing them how you can have layered feedback through peer review you know and and self-reflection it doesn't all have to be on you and it's, it's just opening up all whole new worlds for faculty who never even thought about administering assessment other than multiple choice exam Well, the, the next question I think is a really important one. So as we're seeing these changes, the question is how do we keep these changes? <laughs> you know, so COVID hopefully will go away um, sooner than later, fingers crossed. Um, and so if and when it does, um, is there going to be a huge push to go back to the way things were? Um, how do we integrate and how do, how do we parse out these good things that have happened without carrying along with them the negative emotional baggage that people associate with them, you know, and, and that, that feeling of I want to go back to the good old days when, when it was, you know, whatever. How are we going to preserve these things? Have you, have you seen anything? Have you done anything that you think is working to that effect? Well, Eric, that's actually, um, I was invited to instruct a course on human diversity this last semester. Um, it was an eight week session, two days a week. And um, because of because of the experience that university had had, because it's not my, um, it's not my USF, um, it was, it's a private university in Florida. 
And because of the experience that they had when COVID hit in the spring and how just, excuse my language, like all hell broke loose, they did not know what to do for their students because they were such a traditional university. Um, they were so like blown away with the design of the course um, when I went in to teach that I was able to meet with the adjunct coordinator as well as the student um, personnel support person um, and really look at universal design for learning and how they can integrate it into their support pieces for all of their adjunct instructors and then also how um, that ties in for the supports that are offered for the students um, through that role and the services that the university has. And those are more sustainable things because mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. go, they'll go into um, from practice to policy. And, you know, we always look at the opportunities for professional learning are great mm -hmm. if, if they transfer back to practice, which mm -hmm. then become policy so that it becomes more of a um, living, breathing thing of the, of the university, right. so. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. wonderful. I was muted, sorry. Um, we just had a conversation, a few of us around lunch, not long ago, that we're hoping the option for Zoom class attendance will remain because we have these beautiful devices that someone generously donated the funds for, and we don't want to just see them in a storage closet or sitting in the back of the room collecting dust, that um, I'm hopeful if, if when COVID's over and we're back to whatever this new normal will look like, I fully intend to post a Zoom link for my classes at the top of my LMS um, you know, course shell and say, if you need to Zoom, just let me know so I know to turn on the computer. And um, hopefully at least in that very small way, we will see some lasting changes. But I also know that um, there have been discussions with HR around um, revising our work policy for staff that they would be able to have a more flexible work policy moving forward. So that um, that's exciting because we can we can get work we I would really like to see that. changes that yeah, you, you bring up not doing a smash up job, even in K-12, our primary, you know, through high school, through secondary. I am hopeful that maybe remote options will remain um, even for our, our public school students or even private schools. My children are actually, a couple of mine, one in particular is really thriving in a remote setting. Mm -hmm. um, where she doesn't, she hasn't been thriving. Uh, she's had... She's got anxiety and she's missed fewer days so far this year than she did at this point in the year, any year prior. Yeah. So I'm hopeful that some of these options will stick around even for K-12. So, so just to verify, when you say the remote options, just so that we're talking the same language across states and countries here, um, 
we in Florida have always had virtual education available. Always, it's a part, it's, it's by law, every school has to send a letter home. But what's different for us for the remote learning is I think that social emotional piece is integrated because mm -hmm. it's more of being a part of a classroom, even though you might not physically be there every day or at all. And that's been a deal breaker, I think, for many. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I would agree. Mm. If Illinois has had a remote, like online option before, I've not been aware of it. Okay. Um, but I, my, my one daughter, it's, it's been great for her to be home and she gets five minutes between each class session and she can go out and run around our court and get some exercise and then come back and do the next class. And that's really been, you know, she can be laying upside down on her bed and still access class and no one's fussing at her. And it's, it, that flexibility has really been helpful um, even from a K-12 standpoint or primary secondary for our um, non-US folks. So lots of things that I think we're all hoping stick around. Yeah, you're really making me think about um, David Rose's um, speech that he gives about or presentation that he gives about the physical school building and how you know we accessibility became a thing after the fact and look at how ugly it was in regards to the work that it took to add to the buildings and whatnot and what if we were able to approach our curriculum um, from that proactive stance and I think that that's a positive here I know that COVID is very much, you know, has taken people's lives and it's not anything that we would ever wish on anyone, but it, I think that the silver lining, like Dixie was saying, is that it does give us the opportunity to turn things upside down and for it to be okay for learners like your daughter to be doing somersaults while she's doing her learning, you know? Um, because it doesn't mean that she can't learn it means that she has her own way of approaching that. And, and that brings in the, the all, right? Making sure that every student and every approach to learning has the opportunity to present itself um, through the systems that we develop for everyone, right? Yep, yep. I awesome. agree. Well, welcome back everyone. And we hope that you had productive discussions in your breakouts um, and, and that we were able to move not only through what's going well, but how we preserve what's going well, you know, parsing that from, from the negative. Um, Jen, do you wanna take back over? I, I can't hear you, can, can others hear her? Sorry, my bad. No. Um, I have double muting powers and I always forget which thing is muted. So yes, um, in our group, we definitely forgot to nominate somebody to share. <laughs> So maybe other groups did too, we'll find out. Um, but I'm gonna share the screen and we can take a look at everybody's ideas. Um, I love it when the ideas are so many that you have to go to like eight point font. So let me present that so it's a little bit bigger at least. Okay, so somebody from breakout group one wanna share and you can just share maybe some of the, the big picture ideas or um, comments as you all had in your group. So just unmute you can go for it. Hi. Um, I guess I don't, I, I don't mind. Um, so just um, a couple of the things that um, I'll point out and just say just, you know, increased collaboration between the different departments and service areas. Um, more focus on accessibility with going digital and, you know, with due to COVID, it, it became like everyone's responsibility to contribute to accessibility, not just like, uh, you know, select departments, um, just the opportunity for colleagues to flourish with, you know, um, um, online sessions, um, um, you know, expansion use of tools or, you know, different tools, especially Zoom. Um, Darla, Marla, is there anything else you want to add? I think the main thing I would say is, um, like for us, a lot of things that um, was previously impossible, we couldn't offer those options or there were things that couldn't have occurred online or um, 
I think we all knew that they were possible. And what do you know, um, when everything moves remote, it absolutely is possible. And I think um, for me, there's been, there's been a lot of positives at our institution and our group discussed that. Um, and we're hoping a lot of them stay. And even if that's not the primary mode of delivery, the resources and processes and um, teaching that has occurred over this time is going to serve as really powerful options um, in the future. And, and if we move back to some kind of normal, um, all of that work's been done. And we hope that that, that work remains um, as really powerful learning options for students. Great. Thank you all. Um, let's see, let me look at group two. Oh man, group two, sad day. Is there anybody that was in group two that wants to just share group, that? Group two was my group, which ended up as the main group and I couldn't figure that out. So I just made a separate slide for us. So. Okay, let's see if we can. Well, we'll come back. We'll come back to you, group two. Um, group three. Uh, I was in group three and I think uh, 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 our fellow group members, I think it's just me and Michelle left. Um, Right, I think Celine and Julie and Sherry had to go. Um, should I just go ahead and share? Sure. You can hear me okay? All right. Yeah. Um, so uh, similar to what group one discussed, um, there's been, I guess, kind of like uh, uh, Julie's words, silver lining, right? Certain things that weren't transparent to, I guess, like faculty and uh, practices and, and, you know, in the teaching and learning are, are now more transparent. Um, uh, we talked about developing authentic assessments during this time and hopefully carrying that through. Um, what else? Disruption. Oh, um, uh, instructors are actively seeking more um, support, which is good too, because it's there. I know another thing we talked about is there's been a lot more communication and collaboration between different um, like factions of the institution, um, which is obviously very good. Um, I, I can't, so many times it's like, you know, you meet staff and other like college professionals that maybe don't know about other services and supports that can help students and things are becoming more transparent and clear. Um, I don't know what else to add. Michelle, would you like to add anything if you're there? <laughs> okay. I don't have anything to add and there's an immense amount of background noise here. So I think we should move to group four. Okay, group four it is. <laughs> Fair enough, all right, group four. Yeah, so I guess that's me. Uh, um, yeah, so we talked about a, a good bit in our group. It was, um, we kind of we had a good really good diverse group but we just thought one of the things um roslinda talked about was in their university where they have like over ten thousand teaching staff because they're the largest university where they are and that you know they have to go through there's a, like a udl training module for them where all staff can get trained up on udl which was really good and we talked about you know um, more sharing and kind of more training because you know we do, um COVID pushed us online really quickly and we, uh, we had a technology learning forum that kind of worked together to push out CPD around accessibility and the, the technology learning forum consisted of people from IT, educational technologists, um, disability, uh, acad academia, so they really started working together and they helped spread a lot of information across campus really quickly and promote ideas and share ideas of things that worked and that didn't work. So other people started saying, actually, I can offer this kind of difference, um, this different options in my class too. So there was this real kind of uptake and suddenly people are interested in accessibility, interested in kind of things like captioning, interested in, you know, about changing their approaches to how they were delivering their material. Um, the undercover UDL advocate, um, I can't remember what that, um, what was that about? Oh, that was to do with um, Thomas Tobin and that was, um, I think it was Anita was talking about how you know you, you have to be kind of pushing uh, the UDL agenda the whole time kind of you're there within the departments pushing all this kind of information that everybody has it and I mentioned Thomas Tobin talks about you know the plus one as well about picking something rather than trying to overwhelm because one of the things that came up in CPD was everybody's like accessibility too I'm, I'm struggling to push everything online please don't ask me to make myself accessible and they're like I really want to help those students but I can't and I'm like it's not really a, you have a legal obligation here to be doing this and even more so now in terms of an Irish context um, and for, yeah so the university wide thing was the thing that Rosalinda talked about and the effort that they're doing over there which seems really interesting um, 
the captioning thing and not auto captioning. Um, I have a real issue with auto captioning and people who say, oh, it's grand or it'll do or it'll, it, it doesn't work. And if you're outside America, it definitely doesn't work. If you're Irish, it doesn't work. It's just, it's ridiculous. I wouldn't even dream like auto captioning. The students are coming back telling me they're like, I can't read half of this. We have a month of students in a month of teaching staff in our university who English isn't their first language. So their accents are different and it's just not picking it up and the accuracy is way off. And even as you can see here, I'm speaking extremely quickly. And if you speak quickly at all, it doesn't work. And um, so just think about, you know, sustainable mo models and captioning. If we're offering UDL and you put it into policy, how do you put that across campus? Because I don't want captioning just for my deaf and hard to hear students. I want it for students where English isn't their first language. I want it for students who have processing delay. I want it for students who also want to transcript who, so we don't have to provide note takers and that we're looking at giving something because I use it on Netflix. Most students now are reading on their tablet device so they want that captioning. It's not about, oh yeah, let's provide it afterwards and all the captions, as I said, wouldn't work. Um, uh, we, um, oh, sorry, I, I can't remember her name. She brought up about, um, apologies, uh, about the proctoring and issues like that, the expense that occurred when everybody moves online and the proctoring uh, costs that are involved in that and that moving away from proctoring and getting the lecturers to think more again about how can we deliver this without using the proctoring for exams and thinking about, you know, and it really created different ideas and ways people started to engage with material and think about different ways that they could uh, assess their students. So a lot of really rich kind of information came out of trying to circumnavigate an issue that was there about the cost that involves with proctoring. And that's one of the things that was there, a little bit of a team there was, you know, sustainability and costing as we move to kind of an online presence, how are we gonna, how are we gonna look at that and how we can manage that. Um, I mentioned as well about side license. So I'm currently pushing a lot of side licenses on campus rather than give individual supports for student cohorts. But I'm coming across loads of stuff. I have to go through cloud governance, ITD, data protection, GDPR, and the government solicitor. And if you're using software that's outside America, like Rev or whatever, then there's a whole different GDPR. So I'm there dealing with stuff like SMAs and stuff that I never even heard of. I'm going through legal jargon. I'm like, this is not my job. But it's literally, I've been working on these processes since March, it's November now, and I'm still not getting through. And as soon as I try and get them through, it's like, who's gonna support these afterwards? And I'm like, the IT department's gotta support them. And they're like, we're not taking on extra work unless there's money involved. And you're just like, there's, there's a lot of resistance to why, even if you're trying to be proactive, and even though we're looking at, you know, giving side license on stuff like Grammarly, uh, uh, literacy softwares, um, captioning softwares, um, mind mapping softwares, all these kind of things that students could find beneficial. It's still fighting, finding a bit of resistance. Um, and the other thing that we mentioned about, you know, should, now I talked about, you know, we've been, it's, if, I used to always believe at the start that it was a top down process, UDL getting on campus, but I since learned that it's top down, middle, middle out and bottom up. You have to have to treat them or it just won't work. But one of the things we're saying about, and that needs to go into upper management where they put it into the contracts of new academic staff. And we talked about, you know, the hiring process and should we have, you know, ability to create accessible material, uh, experience with UDL process as part of what comes in now when you're, inter you're interviewing student, uh, staff members into learning and teaching positions. And we also talked about, I talked about procurement. Um, you know, procurement's a big issue at the moment. We have legal man uh, legislation that say, you know, Lectures, our campus is massive, loads of different departments, and they're always trying to bring on new technologies, new VLEs, but no one's stopping to ask, you know, are these accessible? They'll ask if they're GDPR compliant, but they won't ask if they're accessible. So six months down the line, you realize you can't even make them accessible. You spend a fortune of time, wasted resources, CPD, for stuff that you shouldn't have brought in in the first place. So it, it's much bigger than just a simple, it goes to so many facets. And while COVID, we were saying kind of overall has brought a lot of positivity in terms of you know, these new new avenues for how we teach and how we engage with our students. And there are a lot of finer details. And one of the other things we talked about, which I'm not gonna get here was about, you know, putting UDL into the university policy and how you can stand over that in terms of the legal ramifications. And, you know, ask if anybody wants, suddenly everybody in campus suddenly wants captioning and you're not have you don't have a sustainable model financially, how do you work that? Um, I think that covers it. Thank you, Thomas. Um, okay, let's see. Breakout group five. Um, this was my group. Does anybody else want to share, Aaron? Or I can I can share. Okay, go for it. Sure. Um, so we talked about. I think this came up for several of us, um, but obviously more faculty have gone through our uh, all the centers um, training. 
uh, resources, um, either formally or informally, and those do include UDL. So they're either getting a first shot at UDL and maybe not implementing it, but at least you know they're you know they're either seeing it and maybe um, either trying to implement it or thinking about it and going to follow up with it later. So that's one thing. Um, so that's so that, that's one thing. Um, Several, uh, for me, I know that we were able to actually use some research that we had been doing prior to the pandemic to uh, justify using some of our federal CARES funds to um, fund a, a major captioning, third party captioning uh, initiative. So that's, uh, that was huge for us. Um, there, we have an, we have an uh, international have, audience here. Can, can you explain what the CARES funds are? So yeah, so uh, as yes, as a uh, as a result of the um, of the pandemic, the uh, the federal government uh, offered support, funding support to all kinds of organizations, but universities were able to get federal funds, and as a result of the pandemic, and so one of the things that our university used that was called the CARES Act, and one of our one of the things that our university used that for was captioning. So um, and all kinds of all kinds of, of institutions got funds from CARES. It was not just an education thing. So um, let's see what else. Uh, one of the things that Jen brought up, and this is I I think this is absolutely true, um, that student barriers are much more obvious to faculty during pandemic. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we brought that up because because I guess that's definitely something I've seen for sure. Um, and that she, one of the things that she's been stressing with faculty and her uh, interactions with faculty is that uh, executive functioning for the students and for faculty and for us has been you know stressed and reduced and uh, faculty are now aware of these problems and so our using you know and then kind of using that as an entry point to udl that you you know you you know here's here's a place to implement udl you know because or a reason for implementing udl uh because students are having challenges for all these other myriad reasons in in their lives um what else what else um just i think the we didn't really get to the final question um, but we did talk a lot about the other two. So I think most of the other things have been covered by other groups. Anybody else? Is there anything else that we talked about? That's great. All right, let's see. Our last group in there. Eric, I think that was your group in the main room. Who's it gonna be? Wait for it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we had we had a great conversation. I think you know we were all one of the one of the big takeaways I'm seeing at this point coming later in in this debrief together is how much we're all seeing similar things. Yeah, you know, I think that's that's helpful for me to see. You know that it's it's not an isolated thing that we're seeing a trend where where people are recognizing that. Um, seeing the need for accessibility, seeing the need to to develop for variability now more than ever. Um, and I, I do think I'm really excited to hear some of the things that are coming about for making that a permanent fix. It's been something that that we're, you know, championing for here, but I'm, I'm st still feeling a bit nervous myself, honestly, that that when if we get a vaccine, you know, and so forth, and there's this rapid push to go back to normal that <laughs> oh good we don't have to caption videos anymore you know or or worry about all that training and udl you know so um really finding ways to capture the momentum and and parse out the good from the bad i think will be really valuable um and as you were saying that that recognition that faculty now see um 
diversity and so forth in their students now more than ever, getting them to see that it's always there, <laughs> you know, and like it doesn't go away because there's no pandemic, you know, it's, it's that it's, it's less explicit to you um, and getting that kind of finding ways to, to frame that conversation, I think will be um, really powerful. Our group did talk a little bit about what, what I haven't heard anybody else talk about with um, professional development as well being a positive takeaway from this. You know, we're seeing a lot more faculty want to um, want to engage, but but also like on my team, which facilitates these professional development offerings, we're really cranking out a lot more um, and in, in more modalities. You know, so we're seeing we can't have people coming to our workshops anymore. So we're developing a lot more asynchronous content. Um, that meets people's needs just in time, that sort of thing. Like others have said, we we entered into a contract for captioning. Um, and in fact, the chancellor just instigated a commission for disability, which has been something that we've wanted for years and years and years. And so like now we finally get that and I'm hoping that will be a sustainable, um, you know, keeping those voices at the table to facilitate long-term change. Sorry, Eric, what does that mean? It means that, so the chancellor has several commissions. So they're basically subgroups that focus on um, the needs of a particular group on campus. So previously we had, for example, a commission for blacks, a commission for LGBTQ, um, and, and but we've never had a commission for disability. And so now that we do, that commission brings people, faculty, staff, administrators, and students together to, to say, these are the issues that we're seeing on campus that need support, you know, and we can, we have the ear of the chancellor we have the ear you know, of, of the upper administrators to say, this is what we've synthesized as our top priorities you know, to get the support that we need to actually do things. Um, so in, in a large institution like mine, the work tends to be very piecemeal. You know, This college is doing this, but that college is doing that. And this college isn't anywhere near anything, any of this. You know, so having um, the chancellor involved allows us to say, we're gonna have a campus site license for captioning and a procedure and process for that, you know, that type of thing, which would be a radical um, upgrade from what we have right now. And I'm, I'll also say that we at our university, I'm at the University of Kentucky, which is a large school as well, we also don't have a, like an accessibility team or commission or anything like that. And so over the last year, a couple other folks, um, somebody from the Disability Resource Center, some of the instructional designers just from all over campus, we just decided to make our own. So we just made our own, like we made our own accessibility task force and, and we've been working on um, finding some grants and applying for those we haven't gotten any yet, but like we're, at least it's coming, you know, like we're doing the thing. So like, you don't have to wait for your commissioner to sign on board and just start the thing. Good call. I just wanted to say if that's all right, um, in Australia where we're, we're heading back because we've, COVID, we've got COVID under control it here and we're heading back to what we're now calling dual um, delivery. Where, and so there's this discussion that there'll be people on campus and people online and so people can choose, which is sort of UDL, isn't it? They get to choose whether they be in the lecture theatre or they be in the um, online. And so there's this discussion hasn't been fully worked out on how the spaces have to be slightly modified. But uh, I think it goes back to what you're saying, Eric, what is it going to look like later? And, and, and we thought that asynchronous would stay for lectures. We thought that was going to happen. Um, but it's looking because all the students are desperate for that interaction and that feeling of being together, that they're um, looking at especially first year students coming into this dual delivery model. Um, so it's sort of a good thing. Um, for uh, UDL because it's showing that they're looking at preference. They, I, they not definitely don't know they're doing it from that perspective though. <laughs> they, they don't look at it when that they're not figuring out that they've done it from a UDL perspective because in Australia we haven't really, or at least in our university, UDL has is only just starting and, and where I'm just starting with it and, and hoping to get it going. But there's this, that's sort of the, the, the way they're starting to head. All right. Well, thank you all for, for um, having that great conversation. I, I really enjoyed well, hearing I what think, everybody's doing. I think doing. There's, one more, there's one more breakout group. 
if there's if there's time there was a more breakout group I think. oh i'm so sorry i thought okay sorry <laughs> yes group six please oh they're super organized too nice job group six um i i'll speak for group six um so yeah, we, we sort of uh, looked at each of the three guiding questions, as you can see, and a lot of what we were talking about has come up. Our focus was really all about faculty development. Um, so try to I'll try to just summarize some of the, the maybe more unique things. Um, yeah, so I think it's already been reported, like this has really forced faculty to um, let go of some control and and rethink their what their role is as an instructor. And that's um, two of the big barriers, I think, against UDL implementation. So that's really helped. Um, and then the digital teaching has just facilitated um, all of the, the digital learning resources and, and a, I think just opened opened people up to understanding what UDL can offer. We said all our conversations, we keep just authentically saying UDL is the answer to that. <laughs> it just keeps coming up again and again. And of course, um, as has been mentioned, university leadership far more open to um, spending some money right now on some of these things that, that we uh, need to support UDL implementation. Um, the the other current events piece in the second question um, stimulated a, a bit of a discussion about how we've integrated anti-systemic racism anti-oppression work into our udl faculty development um, so that it's that um, simultaneous covid and um, the events that have happened in in especially in north america so in the states and in canada this year um, has has left people open to that. And thanks to COVID and everyone being online, um, so many more people are attending the, these faculty development sessions on all of, all of the equity, diversity, and inclusion topics. So that's great. Um, and um, somewhat Sharon, I think, spoke about being able to invite all kinds of like really big name speakers and being able to have them um, be, be part of the conversation which is something, again, that's a little bit easier to do right now than it may have been in the past. Um, and then I'm trying, my screen's cutting off our stuff at the bottom. Um, for next steps, we were all like, who's got the solution for this? How do we keep it going? But a couple of things, thank you. Um, applying, so uh, Andrew spoke about sort of striking while the, the opportunity was here. So they applied for a grant. It's going to help them with researching the impact, so outcomes of what they're doing. Um, and then just the integration of UDL across all of the faculty development offers. We talked a little bit about both sneaking it in, but also being explicit with always um, talking about UDL and what it is. And uh, what else do we have here? Um, yeah, more of the same. So just more new workshops and trying to put things in place while we have maybe a bit of time and resources that we'll be able to live on. Um, and, and this idea of connecting. So one person was talking about sneaking in UDL and then someone else said the way they do it is they sneak it into faculty development, but then explicitly link to the UDL guidelines. And that's sort of the, the happy middle ground. Um, so I think that's a summary. If Andrew or Sharon or Katya want to add to it, go for it. All right. Yeah, that's a great, I like the that thought about kind of sneaking it in, but then saying, oh, look what I just snuck in on you and kind of explaining that I mean, this was not by accident. This was designed because of the variability we knew we would have in this group. So I think that's a really good impact and a good way to do that. Um, okay, well, this has been really helpful. I appreciate everybody sharing um, their ideas and, and what's going really well at, at your institutions today. Keep in mind um, our February meeting, which will be um, really awesome. I can't actually, I'm really looking forward to that. And I think, unless you can think of anything else, Eric. Um, just, just one other thing I want to remind everybody, I didn't talk about it very thoroughly. The pop-up meetings is, is the, um, the new casual, like if you have a topic that you think 
people would be interested in, let us know. And we can set these meetings up and it's just whoever shows up, shows up sort of thing. So as the quarterly meetings are becoming more structured, the pop-up meetings are meant to be very flexible and, and member driven. So please let us know if you have a topic that you would like to have a pop-up session for. We'd love to facilitate more of those. Is there, is there a link to those slides? I couldn't see, I couldn't sort of access the link. I'd it like to sort of- be, um, I can put it in the chat box though. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's also on the um, the doc, if you were able to get into the Google doc. Thank you. All right, so the, the meeting, the links for the, the slides yep. that we use for the meeting. Okay, well everybody have a good one. Stay well. Take care. And we'll see you soon. Bye.